Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever the case may be. Uh, this video here is going to be 1-3, uh, more on functions and their graphs. Uh, this will be uh, just some of the section, the first day of it. And for the warm-up, I got uh, some functions here. Uh, f of x is x squared plus 1. So what would f of 3 be? Well, we take out this x, replace it with the 3. That becomes 3 squared plus 1. I always like to, you know, imagine, you know, this x just as a placeholder it turns into an empty set of parentheses, something squared plus 1. In this case, we're putting a 3 in that set of parentheses. 3 squared is 9. 9 plus 1 is 10. What, though, if we wanted to do f of quantity y plus 1? Well, again, think of the x as a placeholder. So that was x squared plus 1, but now it is the quantity y plus 1 squared plus 1. Now I just feel like foiling, so let's foil this out. That would be y squared plus 2y plus 1. But don't forget, we've also got this plus 1, so we could put a plus 1 on there. And if we add this plus 1 to the other plus 1, we'll get a plus 2. So we could do a little uh, simplification on that, foil it out, and collect like terms. But there we go. That is going to come in useful, I think, on uh, the last example in this section. 1-3, uh, more on functions and their graphs. Our objectives for this section will identify intervals on which a function is increasing, decreasing, or constant. Uh, we'll use graphs to locate relative maxima or minima, you know, uh, maxes and mins, the peaks and the valleys of a graph. Number three, we'll identify even and odd functions and recognize their symmetries. Number four, understand and use piecewise functions. And then finally here, find and simplify a function's difference quotient. That there is a lead-in to calculus, sort of like one of the building blocks. But here the book starts us off with this graph, and the title of it is Average Fuel Efficiency for U.S. Passenger Cars. We're going back from the 1950s to 2009, and on our y-axis are the average fuel efficiency miles per gallon. We could see we were hovering around 15, got a little worse, a little worse up to the 70s, and then it started to take off. We have a steep line segment. Fuel efficiency greatly increased from uh, 75 to 80. So our miles per gallon were going up here into the low 20s, and and then it's still increased uh, up in through the 70s and 2009. It's still going up slightly as we move along. You know, so uh, some interesting parts of graphs are where they're going up and where they're going down. And do they have minimums or maximums? It's kind of hard to see here, but the lowest this graph goes is right here. That is our minimum value. Minimum fuel efficiency, 14.1 miles per gallon, occurred in 1970. Uh, back then there was an oil embargo gas shot through the roof people had to wait in line to even get a few gallons of gas so uh, the industry responded by becoming up with more fuel efficient cars and a book says you're probably familiar with the uh, words used to describe the graph above uh, decreased increase minimum maximum in this section we're going to enhance your intuitive understanding of ways of describing graphs by viewing these descriptions from the perspective of the functions now here we are going to go through this definition and it is very wordy and full of notation with subscripts and it's confusing but let's read through it and then we'll sort of we'll break one of them apart and you'll see how these math definitions aren't that intimidating. So increase, decreasing, and constant functions. One, a function is increasing on an open interval i if f of x sub 1 is less than f of x sub 2 whenever x sub 1 is less than x sub 2 for any x sub 1 and x sub 2 on the interval. Is that crystal clear? Good. Uh, a function is decreasing on an open interval i if f of x sub 1 is greater than f of x sub 2 whenever x sub 1 is less than x sub 2 for any x sub 1 and x sub 2 in the interval. Is that one good? Okay, on to number three, a function is constant on the open interval i if x sub 1 is equal to x sub 2 for any x sub 1 and x sub 2s in the interval. Okay, now let's take that first one and we're just going to break it down and make a graph as we go. A function is increasing if f of x sub 1 is less than f of x sub 2. Well, the outputs, the f's are over here on the y-axis. Let me move my y-axis over just a little bit. And it says x sub 1 is under or less than x sub 2. So here would be my f of x sub 1. It is underneath 
my f of x sub 2. And continue on whenever x sub 1 is less than x sub 2. So down here on the x-axis, I got to have my x sub 1 to the left of x sub 2 because it is less than. Now let's graph the dots. Here's x sub 1 and its output f of x sub 1. So there's our x1 dot. And then if we go over to x sub 2, we got to travel up farther to get to its output on the y-axis. If I connect the dots from left to right, we're going uphill. That is the definition of increasing. So yeah, the, uh, the definition is very wordy and full of notation and stuff, but when you break it down, it's just a very convoluted and very rigorous way to say the function's going uphill. To change that to the decreasing definition, it says here if f of x sub 1 is now greater than x sub 2. So what we would do is just need to switch these. This is now x sub 1. I'll use blue ink down here is x sub 2 in blue ink. So now my x1 f of x sub 1 is up here and my x sub 2 is matched up to this point on the y-axis. So again if we go left to right now the function is going downhill it is decreasing. So again I, I don't want to just skip over the math definitions. If you're taking higher level math in college you will be seeing those come back. And again they're not that intimidating. You know if you just break them down take it chunk by chunk maybe draw a graph as you go it all makes sense. Example one. Intervals on which a function is increasing, decreasing, or constant state the intervals on which our function has which behavior. Let me just blow these up a little bit. And because I have my Mimeo pad, I'm going to use a little color coding. So I'm going to go over here, switch to red ink. And uh, we always read our graphs from left to right, just like we read the English language. So we come in here, the farthest left I see on the graph is right here. And as I'm coloring over this, I am decreasing, 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 and then I stop decreasing. And now I'll leave it blue because now the graph's going uphill, uphill. We're increasing, increasing, increasing until we get to the peak of a hill and then we start decreasing again. So here it is color coded. And I'm going to do it this way. Decreasing. Where was our de graph decreasing? Well, since the graph goes off to infinity, way over here to the left is negative infinity. And that graph was decreasing until we got to, on the x-axis, x is 0. So we decreased. Over here, I'll switch to blue. I'll put my increasing on this side. Increasing, we started here at x is 0, and we went until x is 2. So on this stretch of the x-axis from 0 to 2, we were increasing. And then here back at 2, and we went off to the right toward infinity, so from 2 to infinity, we went back to decreasing. So there's our interval. We've accounted for the entire number line, negative infinity to 0, and then that interval picks up here, 0 to 2, and then where this leaves off, the last one picks up 2 to infinity. Uh, for this graph, there were no constant places. It was all increasing and decreasing. Aha. Uh -huh. So let's see here. Uh, the farthest left on the graph is right here. So if we start coming in, we're flat and we're constant until we get to here. And that's at x is 0. So from negative infinity all the way to 0, we had constant. Now our next interval picks up where this one left off at 0. And now we're going from 0 and the graph just goes up this way to infinity. It's also heading out this way. So from 0 to infinity, it's now increasing. And I think that's all they wanted for that one. We just, again, uh, well, in the uh, most common mistake I've seen over this in years past, remember they want the intervals here from the x-axis. I've seen in a similar type problem, maybe some students would go to the y-axis and say this interval goes from 0 to 4. Remember here, we're looking at inputs, and our inputs come from the x-axis, our domain axis. So we want to take this back. You know, if you want to, you can take the peaks and the valleys. You know, here's a peak. Go right down to the x-axis. You know, if we had a valley come down here, you'd find that valley and take it to the x-axis. That is what's going to chop up your intervals of increasing and decreasing. 
uh, the points at which functions change from increase to decrease or decrease to increase uh, can be used to find relative minimums and maximums of the function. So time for another wordy definition. A function value f of a is a relative max of the function f if there exists an open interval containing a such that f of a is greater than f of x for all x is not equal to a in that open interval. 2. A function value f of b is a relative minimum of the function if there exists an open interval containing b such that f of b is less than f of x for all x is not equal to b in the open interval. Uh, the word local is sometimes used instead of relative. You know, it's usually that comes down to the textbook author. Okay, let's look at this one. Uh, we'll just analyze the first one. Uh, maximum. It says f of a is greater than f of x for all other points in the interval. Like let's say we got an interval, they're calling this uh, interval i, and we've got a point here. And if I take that over to the x-axis, this is f of a. And now back to the definition down here, f of a is greater than f of x for all other x's. So, you know, here's our point a, and it takes us to this point, that's f of a. And what this says is every other x value in here that's not a is going to give you an x value or an f value, an output under here. All the f of x's are going to be underneath the f of a value. So no matter what my value is, I know my points are going to be underneath that other dot. So when I connect the dots, that will be a peak. Uh, if I slide this slide up, for a min, you just reverse f of b is greater than, or uh, x is, f of x is greater than the f of b's. So if you wanted to do a min, here's point b, and here's its output f of b. This definition says that's a min if all the other x values, no matter where they are in that interval, are going to have outputs above f of b. So we could put some more dots up here, but we do know f of b is going to be the lowest of the low, so that is our minimum value if we connect those dots. Now what's this great question? Uh, do you use the x-coordinates or y-coordinates when describing a function? Well, I already talked about that. I'm ahead of the book because we always go to the x-axis, our domain axis. Now, if the graph of a function is given, we can often visually locate the number or numbers at which we have mins and maxes. We can at least take a good guess, maybe eyeball it. Uh, so here they give us a, a sine graph down here, and they want us to find some mins and maxes. So let's see here. Let's start over here on the left, and as we're working our way across, we get down here, we sort of see this valley, and we see the x value that made it happen is at negative pi over 2. So um, f has a minimum value, uh, f of negative pi over 2, that's a negative in there, is equal to what's our output if we take that red point over to the y-axis, negative 1. As we keep moving along the graph, now we're going uphill, 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 and then we switch to downhill. So when we switch from uphill to downhill, this has to be a max here. And if we take it down to the x-axis, the x value that made that happen is positive pi over 2. Let me just rewrite it here. f of positive pi over 2 is equal to the height of this hill on the y-axis is 1 f of pi over 2 is equal to 1 is a relative max. Or we could write that point as, you know, a coordinate pair, point 2, or excuse me, pi over 2, comma 1. We could have done that for the min also. Our minimum is at negative pi over 2, comma, negative 1. Uh, next up, even and odd symmetry. Uh, is beauty in the eye of the beholder? Or are there certain objects or people that are so well balanced and proportional they are universally pleasing to the eye? 
What constitutes an attractive human face? I don't think I put that figure. It's no, and this isn't even in our book. I sort of grabbed this from another book. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Did you know that graphs of some equations exhibit exactly the kind of symmetry shown by, you know, a symmetrical face? The word symmetry comes from the Greek word symmetria, meaning the same measure. We can identify a function whose graph has symmetry by looking at the equation and determine if that function is even or odd. Now again, here's some confusion with the notation. Hopefully the way I present the example, it might clear up any confusion you have. But it says a function uh, is even if f of negative x is the same as f of x for all x's in the domain. It's kind of like the function was hungry and it just ate that negative up. f of negative x is equal to f of x, same thing. Uh, blah, blah, blah. The function of uh, f is odd if f of negative x is equal to the negation of f of x. Remember up here, it looks like the function just ate that negative sign up. Here, it's like that negative sign sort of slipped out and now is in front of the function. So f of negative x is the same as the negation of f of x for all x's in the domain. Okay, so what the heck does that mean? What's all this f of x, f of negative x? Well, let's go through example two here. And I'll show you this the way I come up with a few years ago to uh, sort of work through one of these very systematically. And you can figure out if it's even, odd, or neither. So here's our first function. And I'm just going to recopy it down here. I'm going to use red ink. f of x is x cubed minus 6x. So this is our starting function. What we want to compare our final answer to is the negative of f of x. So what we want to do to that, if I put a negative on the left side here in front of this f of x, I've got to negate the other side. Now be careful, this was a quantity, x cubed minus 6x, I'm going to put the negative outside. Because we're negating the whole left side, putting this negative out here. we got to negate the whole right side, and we're going to do that, we're going to have to distribute. So if we distribute there, we're going to get negative x cubed plus 6x. Now let me move this out of the way. So again, in red is what they gave us to get us started, f of x. We now have found ourselves the negation, negative f of x. Now here's where we test if our function is even, odd, or neither. We're going to find f of negative x, and we're going to simplify it here. If that takes us back to the red answer where we started, our function was even. If after we simplify this, it takes us to the blue function, we were odd. If it doesn't fit the blue or the red, if it's not even or odd, then it's neither. Okay, get that out of the way. All right, f of negative x. So like I had in that warm-up, you know, x cubed minus 6x is something cubed minus 6 times that same something. But now in those parentheses, we replace the x with a negative x. I think back to algebra one or even pre-algebra, negative x to the third, or a negative times a negative times another negative is going to be negative x, and it will still be cubed. And then here we have a negative six times a negative x, so that will change to a plus six x. So here is our f of negative x. Does it take us back to the original equation? No, completely different. So we know we are not even. Does this take us to the blue answer? Perfectly. Negative x cubed plus 6x, negative x cubed plus 6x. So to sort of bring that definition back from the previous slide that was a little confusing, we just showed here that this f of negative x, f of negative x is exactly the same as negative f of x negative f of x. And that's the definition of odd. Remember, it's sort of like that negative escapes out in front of the f. Yeah, right here. There's our odd function. So again, just to recap, you got your original f of x. Distribute a negative, so that is your negation, negative f of x. Then evaluate negative x inside the function, f of the negative of x. If it takes you to the original, even. If it takes you to the negation, it's odd. If it's neither of those, it's not even or odd. It's neither. Letter B. I'm just going to rewrite it here. G of x equals x to the fourth minus 2x squared. So I'm going to put a negative 
over on the g of x side, negative of g of x is equal to, now here I'm going to do it at one step, I'm going to distribute a negative. So this x to the fourth is now a, whoop, get out of there, a negative x to the fourth, and we'll distribute a negative, I hit that minus, change it to a plus 2x squared. Okay, let's perform the test. We're going to take our original g function and put a negative in there with the x. So this is a negative. Oh, did I mess something up? Yes. No, 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 we should be good. Uh, negative x to the fourth minus 2 times negative x squared. Oops, 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 that squared should be outside. There we go. So let's see here. It's a negative, and it's to the fourth power. A negative times a negative times another negative times another negative is positive. So this becomes a positive x to the fourth. And then this here, negative x squares to a positive x. So this becomes an x squared, and it still has this minus 2 attached to it. So this is our g of negative x. Well, let's see. Did that take us over here what I have in red? No. So again, that would tell us if we were odd. It's not an odd function. Does this take us back to the original here? x to the fourth minus 2x squared, x to the fourth, there it is. We have found an even function. So in this case, g of negative x was the same thing as the original g of x. And that's right here. f of x, f of negative x is equal to the original f of x. It's an even function. So we've had an even, we've had an odd. I'll give you a guess at what the last one is probably going to be. And, well, just to keep myself from having to copy that. It's the last one. I'm just going to sort of put it over here. So there's h of x. If I do the negation of h of x, I'm going to distribute a negative, so all these will change to minus signs. Negative x squared minus 2x minus 1. So now to perform the test, we're going to put a negative x into the function. So that was something squared plus 2 times something plus 1. In goes the negative x. Well, negative x squared becomes a positive x squared. Here, this 2 times a negative x will change that to a minus 2x, and then we have a plus 1. So did that take us back to where we started? No, the sign is off there. Did that take us to our negation? No, two of the signs are off. So it's not even, it's not odd, it's neither. It's neither even nor odd. Now let's see what the even and odd functions tell us about the graph. Uh, let's see here. I'm just, I'm gonna not read through all this stuff. Let's just go right here. When we look at this, we saw what? Um, when f of x was the same as f of negative x, that was even. Just think about a parabola. Here's an upward opening parabola. If I just pick out a couple points here, like x is 3, that takes me to 5. If I go to negative 3, negative 3 also takes me to 5. So this would be f of x, that would be f of 3 is equal to 5. And then here's negative 3 f of negative 3 also takes us to the same height of 5. So what you'll see here is symmetry with respect to the y-axis. You know, an even function splits the y-axis. So here's our y-axis. We can see this side of the function. If we reflect it over, uh, it will fall on top of the other half and vice versa. So y-axis symmetry is an even function. There's our f of negative x is equal to f of x. Symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Uh, let me key. Well, why did they give us this one and not show us a good odd one also? So just to always, when I was first learning these, to keep these straight in my head, I always thought the simplest even function is x squared. It's a parabola opening up. If I just think negative or 2 takes me up to 4, 
negative 2 also takes me to 4, so it's parabolic in shape, splits the y-axis. The simplest odd function is x to the third. Remember, that sort of looks like this. If I put in positive 2, 2 to the third power is 8. If I put in negative 2, negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 takes us to negative 8. So there's our odd symmetry around the origin. If I go over 2 this way, I go up 8. If I go 2 the other way, I go down 8. So we uh, have symmetry to the origin. Now, m a lot of origin symmetric functions, a lot of odd functions do go through the origin, but they don't have to. Uh, you might see an odd function like this. Uh, the 1 over x function looks sort of like this in the first and the third quadrants. You know, this point is reflected across to here. Uh, you, it is an, uh, an odd function. It has origin symmetry, but it does not actually pass through the origin. Okay. Uh, the graph of an even function, symmetric to the y-axis. We already talked about that. Uh, symmetric to the uh, origin is an odd function. Odd functions, origin, symmetry. Both start with the letter O. Uh, up next is a piecewise function. This is like a few functions in one. So let's just read what the book has here. A cell phone company offers a plan. 20 bucks a month buys you 60 minutes. Additional time is 40 cents a minute. Uh, we can represent this plan mathematically by writing a total monthly cost, C, as a function of the number of calling minutes, T. Now, the most important part of a piecewise function is over here where you're sorting your inputs. So here we're talking T for time. Uh, uh, most functions will have X as the most common variable. But it says here if your time is between 0 and 60, you're going to use the top piece of the piecewise function. And if your t value is over 60, you're going to use the bottom piece of the piecewise function. And you know, you could have more than two pieces, three, four, or even five. But the first thing you do is you take your input and figure out where you're going to sort it to. Does it go into which piece of the piecewise function? Um, so here we got, if our time is between 0 and 60, we could call 0 minutes, we could call 60 minutes, uh, cost 20 bucks. Doesn't matter how many minutes we use, all or none. 20 bucks. If we go beyond 60 minutes, we're going to do the 20 bucks plus 40 cents for each minute beyond the 60. So we have here 40 cents times the quantity t minus 60. Uh, a function that is defined by two or more equations over a specified domain is called a piecewise function. Uh, many cell phone plans can be represented with piecewise functions. And here's what the graph of it would look like. Uh, for the first 40 minutes, or 60 minutes, excuse me, we're constant. Our graph is flat. Our total cost is 20 bucks, no matter what. After we've used up those 60 minutes, we start paying money for each minute. So we have a linear sloped line heading up there, slope of 0.4. So uh, example three, using the function described in the cell phone plan. That looks like the same one from before. Find and interpret the data for each of the following. C of 30. What's the total cost for 30 minutes? So we take our input 30 and we come over here and we see that 30 is going to land in between 0 and 60. So we've sorted into the top piece and our answer we know there's no variable to even put the time in for. C of 30 is equal to 20 bucks. Now for part B, our input is 100. 100 is greater than 60, so we're going to put that 100 into this bottom piece of the piecewise function. I'll switch over to blue ink and move down here. So that's going to be 20 plus 0.40 times t minus 60 right there. Now let's see, of course, uh, order of operations. We're going to start inside the parenthesis first. Uh, 100 minus 60 is 40, so we've got 0.40 times 40 and then we're going to add our 20 to that uh, 0.4 times 40 is 6 16 yeah 4 times 4 is 16 move the decimal over two spots so we've got this 20 20 plus 16 equals 36 bucks
Uh, so if I flip back to that graph, we should be able to see both of these points. Our first point was 30 comma 20. And then we just found this point, our input was 100, and our output was about 36. So 30 would be right about here, 30, 20, that looks good. And then if we go over to 100, so between 80 and 120, this would be 100. If we take it up, we're just going to need to sort of eyeball this. But if we take it over, uh, we're in between 20 and 40. We're closer to 40. Uh, we're in between 30 and 40. And actually, my, my line's a little off, a little closer to 40. So we can use the graph to back up what we found uh, algebraically. Uh, some checkpoint questions for you to try. So pause the video, uh, check these problems out, and then fire the video back up and see if you got them right or wrong. Okay, now the first one, remember we're taking this to the x-axis, increase, decrease, or constant. So we're starting way over on the left, our first interval will be from negative infinity to something. And here we're increasing, 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 increasing. It looks like we hit our peak, our x value right below us is negative 1, that interval increase. And then that interval left off at negative 1. The next interval picks up at negative 1 and goes down, decrease, 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 till we hit here. x is positive 1. So the red interval was decreasing. This interval left off at 1. Next one picks up at 1. And we are back to going uphill. We're increasing, and the graph ends. So that's 1 out to infinity. Back to increasing. Even, odd, or neither. So we do our little test here is f of x. The negation of that negative f of x would be negative x squared minus 6. And if we put in our test f of negative x becomes negative x quantity squared plus 6. Ooh, there shouldn't be a squared in there. Uh, negative x quantity squared is x squared plus 6. That took us back to where we started. So that first one there is even. Even function for letter a. Letter B comes out. So there's our G of X. The negative of G of X is negative 7X cubed plus X. Remember, we're distributing a negative to both of those terms. So let's put a negative through our original function. G of negative X will be 7 times negative X cubed minus a negative X. So the negative cubed will uh, still remain negative and that negative can slide out front so that's a negative 7x cubed negative times this negative turns out to a positive positive x and that takes us to the negation so that is an odd function odd function uh, last one letter c x to the fifth plus one our negation negative h of x is negative x to the fifth minus one and if we do h of negative x, that will be a negative x to the fifth plus 1. Because the exponent is odd, the negative will remain. So that'll be a minus x to the fifth plus 1. Did that take us back to the original? No. Did it take us to the negation? No. It's not even. It's not odd. It's neither. Neither even nor odd. No symmetry to the coordinate axes. Is that it? Now this one, uh, use the same function to find and interpret the following. Uh, C of 40, so if we go back to that graph, C of 40, you know, because we are in between 0 and 60, our output is an automatic 20. Oops. So C of 40 is equal to 20. Now the 80, we're just going to go back to here and replace that 100 with an 80. So that'll be... Uh, 20 plus, what was that again, 40 cents for each minute plus, past 60. So that'll be 80 minus 60. So that'll uh, subtract to a 20. 20 times that'll be what, 8? 20 plus 8 is 28 bucks. So we could verify that on a graph. If we go to 80, we should just below the 30 mark. So we come out, oh, there's 80 right on the line. If we go right up here, we hit that. Uh, yeah, it looks like it's right below the 30. So the graph backs up 
what we found algebraically. And what do we got next? Uh, is that, yeah, that was it for the huddle. Oh, okay, where are the mins and maxes? It's a quick, easy one here. Let's find the maxes. Well, here's a peak of a, a hill. That's at negative 4, 4. Negative 4, 4 is a max. And then it goes down and comes back up. Here we are again at 0, 4. That's another max. And it goes down and comes back up here. 4, 4, another max. And, you know, we can't have more than one max. Since it's a tie, since they're all the same height, you know, these are all our, or even a relative max, you know, as long as it's uh, the peak of a little hill, even if there's bigger hills around it, it's always a relative max or a min. And for our mins, it looks like we got two of them. This would be negative 2, comma, negative 4, negative 2, negative 4, and at 2, comma, negative 4, also a minimum value. Well, let me show you here. Even, odd, or neither. I did steal these out of the book. If you if you don't remember it from your last math class or you didn't catch it as we were working through it, there is a shortcut to the even, odd, or neither. Uh, here, if I look at my variables, x to the third, x to the first. If the variable, if the exponents are only odd numbers and there is no constant, no plus or minus a number at the end, that function is always an odd function. If I take the same function, x to the third minus x, and I put a constant, like a plus 2 on there, it's always going to be neither. Odd functions are messed up by constants. Uh, this one, it's squared, and we got a first power. We got an even exponent, we got an odd exponent, so this one is an automatic neither. It's neither even nor odd. Let me just do this here for another one. If we have, say x squared plus 7. If your exponents are all even, and even if you have a constant, constants don't matter. All even exponents means it's an even function. Like if I had x to the 8th plus x to the 6th minus x to the 4th plus 2x squared. Without even doing the test, that's an even function. All the exponents are even numbers. If I put a constant at the end, like a plus or minus 20, it's still going to be an even function. Constants don't mess up even functions. They only mess up odd functions. And I just think back to the very most basic even and odd. If I have x squared, it's a parabola opening up. If I change that to x squared plus 2, it just moves it up the y-axis. We are still symmetric to the y-axis. We still have our symmetry, our even symmetry. If I take x to the third and draw that graph, it is origin symmetric. But if I do x to the third plus 2, if I bump that up two units, it's now off the origin, and it's not going to be uh, symmetric any longer. So there we go. Uh, the homework for this section should be a worksheet. I either got it in class or you can download it from my website. I will see you in the next video.